Yes, John, why don't you take it away on this one? Input lag. You've been looking into it a lot and uh, you've basically consulted who I consider to be the foremost expert on gaming input lag, Nigel Woodles. That's right. He is. Uh, Nigel Woodles, uh, if you go find him on social media, maybe even in, in this video you see under the description, we could put a link to it, but he has been doing an exceptional amount of testing for input lag for years and has a whole system and software solution built to calculate input latency in games. And he, a lot by doing that, he's also assembled a database, which he links to in his uh, X profile where he's collected data that you can sort by different criteria for games across so many platforms. And I found this data super fascinating. And the first thing I wanted to mention actually is the Tekken series because he determined that Tekken 8 is the most responsive Tekken game in series history. Oh, wow. Now, it's very that when I say that, though, some of the older games are actually very, 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 very similar, like within a millisecond of it. But Tekken 8 routinely came out faster than every Tekken game, which is cool. But some of those numbers. So if you look on the PS1, Tekken 1 and 2 were both a little bit over 58 milliseconds of input lag. So that's actually, that's fine. That's actually quite good and responsive. I was just surprised it was as even that high on a retro game. Uh, but as mm. I've seen from his list, you know, the, about the lowest you get on like some Super NES Genesis games is like around 24, 25 milliseconds. It seems to be the absolute basement by and large, mm -hmm. at least for V-Sync stuff, which most games are back then. Uh, but here's what's interesting. So Tekken 3... Uh, goes up to 76 milliseconds. And then when you look at Tekken 4 on PS2, that's back down to 58-ish. And then Tekken 5 goes back up to 76. So Tekken 3 and 5, both of which push their respective systems to kind of the limits, it feels like they needed an extra frame in there for rendering or something. And it caused the input mm -hmm. lag to go up a little bit. Which, uh, yeah, really interesting. And then... When you get to the PS3 era, I was surprised that Tekken 5 Dark Resurrection and then Tekken 6 were both down into the 60s. Uh, 66 milliseconds for Tekken 6 and 63 for Tekken 5. Uh, which, yeah. But I think they probably felt worse at the time because TVs during that era, like HDTV flat panels, were mostly bad when it came to input latency. So you can probably tack on like 100 milliseconds to that, which really puts in... Uh, well, I'll talk about Killzone in a second, but that really puts Killzone 2 into perspective because it, it has bad leg anyway, and then you couple that with TVs of 2009 era, and it was you're probably looking at, like, I could imagine, like, 250 to 280 milliseconds of, of leg across the chain, right? Mm -hmm. But here's... The thing that surprised me was uh, when Tekken 7 first launched, the input leg was bad. It was over 120 milliseconds initially. Uh, and this was when they shifted to Unreal Engine 4. That's They actually patched it and got it down into the 70s, which is comparable with like Tekken 5 and 3. But when it first launched, it was bad. And he also has listed some tests of when he did it, uh, he popped in Tekken 7 unpatched, I guess. I, I don't know how to, I don't understand this part of the data, but at the very bottom, he's got. Uh, results of 240 milliseconds of lag for Tekken 7 running on either the PS5 or on one of the new Xboxes. And this was, mm. oh, this was, okay, if I click on the link, it says patch 5 with raw input lag. So it seems like in some situations, Tekken can be upwards of like 240 milliseconds for some That's reason, which awful. is really weird. <laughs> but is nuts. either way, with Tekken 8, uh, both PS5 and Xbox are around 58, but Xbox actually measured in at 57.87, so under 58 milliseconds. Oh, wow. And on the PC, if you play on a VRR screen without with V-Sync off, it gets down into the 40s, like the low 40s. So that's, that's like super, that that's does make super sense. responsive at that point. 
Yeah, I mean, we've done work with Nigel before. Actually, it's Nigel Woodall, not Woodalls. I was confused with his oh, uh, X yeah. uh, mm. handle, which is Noodles. Anyway, um, yeah, we've done some work with Nigel. I mean, I actually just pulled up the article that Tom did back in the day, oh, yeah. which was uh, about Battlefield and Call of Duty input lag. This was going back to 2017, but Ooh. the actual... Uh, technique used for measuring input lag has kind of persisted to this day it's yep. actually a really fascinating uh thing he's i mean nigel's got various techniques right, right. to hand <clears throat> but the um the technique which was discussed in the video is actually the one that tom used um based on nigel's equipment and basically what it does is convert hdmi to analog component and then when the button is pressed <laughs> um basically two components are disabled uh, meaning that the image that goes through to your screen or rather to the capture card, it, it presents as like a purple or green yeah, border. Bar. Yeah, bar that, that sort of crosses the screen. And, and then basically that is the moment when the button was pressed. And, you know, you can get sub frame accuracy yep, yep. here by seeing where the frame, where the bar is, you know, so f further up is sort of, you know, further back in time further mm -hmm. down closer yep, um, yep. and then you count the number of frames until there is actually an animation point and this is a this is a remarkable way to test so input lag cool. because it it completely removes display latency from the equation if you're using a capture card yep and um yeah you get to see the exact point when the button was pre pressed when previously we had stuff like um uh controller monitor boards where you'd use a high uh, a high-speed camera, yeah, yeah, and you know, basically, the do. button press would, uh, yeah, if you've got this board, the button press would manifest as like a, a lit LED. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can just sort of put the joypad into shot, and you can kind of guess when the button was pressed, or make an educated guess. But yeah, we've kind of moved on to the LED board in a high camera, in a high-speed camera right. shot, to what this is doing, which entirely removes. A lot of which well, almost all I, doubt from. The I do think it's neat just for those that aren't that familiar with analog video. Uh, when Rich says component video, because it's not really around anymore that much, uh, that actually relies on three cables, uh, and it's it's not actually red, green, and blue. It's it's like a I forget it's YPRPB. Yeah, yeah, YPRPB. Yeah. But when you cut out two of those cables, you're left with just one, right? So you're only getting yeah. some of the video to your screen, and that's the trick, basically. And it's super, super cool, I got to say. Yeah. I mean, I was literally going back and looking at Tom's article here because there is some fascinating stuff that's thrown up. He did do his Call of Duty versus um, Battlefield latency. And at the time... Um, Call of Duty was coming in at about 72 to 77 milliseconds. Battlefield 3, which was a 30 FPS game, came in with 157 milliseconds of lag. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, but when Battlefield 4 came along, they'd got it down to 97 milliseconds, which is kind of pretty okay-ish for a 30 FPS game. But not great, obviously. But I think the other thing that came up from Tom's tests, and we've talked about this in the past, is just the immense variability and in input lag of games which target the same frame rate. Yep. The best ones, you know, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare comes in at about 39.3 milliseconds um, versus Doom 2016, which is like 86.8. And, and uh, I think it's really interesting that, you know, we've got almost a, you know, a 50 millisecond, 45 millisecond differential there. Actually, what, and the same another one I found interesting is, so I, obviously I went down the list to look at Killzone 2 and it's 100, yes. 128 milliseconds, at least in its current form, right? You know what else is yeah. 128 milliseconds? Tech and Tag Tournament 2 on the Wii U. <laughs> The Wii U version <laughs> specifically is significantly leggier than every other version of that game. So if, it's that Wii U power. And a friend of mine had only ever played it on the Wii U and was like, man, that game is so leggy. I was like, wait, really? I always thought it was fine. And then I look at this and say, like, oh, you played on the Wii U. <laughs> so it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. quite bad. I also see like uh, there's a bunch of those like classic games you can play on modern consoles like there's Mega Man X here from PS4 123 milliseconds oh of lag. my goodness uh, what? the slowest though if we look at the so Contra Rogue Core which is a terrible game that's 230 something milliseconds of lag apparently and I mean 
Yeah, that's it's River City Girls 2, 150 something milliseconds. That's a, that's a <laughs> Unity based brawler. Uh, sort of a you know, I, I like the, those games, but man, no wonder it feels the way it does. It's just not responsive. Mm-hmm. Uh, s- Switch Mega Man 2. So, I guess if you're playing Mega Man 2 on Switch, it's 115 milliseconds. What the heck? And the original Mega Man 2 is like 25 milliseconds on any. So I have a theory about console input latency, which is that there comes a point, and it may be different for everybody, where it just becomes incredibly noticeable and yeah. it's annoying. And it's probably at like the sort of circa 150 millisecond point. But then, you, you know, because of the controller being inherently, uh, it's not a precise controller like a mouse. Do you know what I mean? Right. Mm. So, you know, when you've got like Call of Duty at 40 milliseconds and uh, Doom 2016 at 86, it's less noticeable. It's kind of, if you can consider the joypad as a, an input lag sponge, yeah. then, you know, it makes it a, quite a lot more difficult to actually be able to tell the difference. Right. That's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, some others just, that just I wanted to highlight, though. There. So there's this thing called Undernight in Birth 2. And Nigel <laughs> mentioned this to me. It's a fighting game. But he, get, depending on the position of where you measure on the screen, he had V-Sync off. Uh, it actually varied. But it was between, like, 6 milliseconds and, like, 14. Uh, which is, that is the <laughs> lowest input lag he's ever tested in any game on this list. Which That's is incredible. stupidly responsive. Uh, unbelievable. That was on PS5. So wow. Uh, he also right the next one up from the list there is Super Mario Brothers three on NES with 24 milliseconds of leg, and then that's pretty impressive. Ketsui, one of the M2 Shot Triggers games, which is not it's 24.9 milliseconds, and that seems you know, to be, be consistent curious. with M2's like Shot Triggers games, and that's maybe one of the reasons they're so well regarded is the input lag is like ultra mega low. You know, I'd be interested actually in the difference of input latency between software quake oh. at 70 hertz versus versus 3D effects quake. That would be interesting, uh, actually. Because I imagine software quake is extremely, extremely low latency, actually. Um, another okay, one I wanted to, you, to tip my hat to real yeah. quick is uh, Moonrider, Vengeful Guardian Moonrider from uh, Joy Masher with a friend of the show, Danilo, <laughs> who worked on that. That freaking game measured in at like 25 milliseconds. Which is lower oh, than yeah. your typical like Super NES Genesis game, uh, and it is a throwback to those games. But you know, seriously, like that's big compliments to those guys for making an action game that's that responsive on a modern console. Is that a sixty hertz mode? It, or it is sixty hertz. It's a sixty hertz that's, game. That's kind of nutty because I would expect a minimum input lag of like fifty milliseconds that's... because you know you've got like if you consider it as three chunks, three frames. Yep. Right? Frame one, the input happens. Frame two, the rendering happens. Frame three, the scan out happens. So to actually get lower than fifty milliseconds is is actually pretty I agree. Incredible. And the thing about this list that makes it extra awesome is that Nigel posts both links to Twitter posts that he's made as well as YouTube links to the videos showing the data. So this thing is this whole sheet is stupidly comprehensive in terms of showing all this leg data, and there's just a That's ton great. of here. So I just wanted to mention that because after talking with him in the Tekken video, I was became very fascinated with all of his tests and just seeing how these games vary and where fighting games in general are landing these days. Uh, I'd love yeah. for him to test an Atari VCS where the games actually travel with the beam. Oh my God. The CRT. Like, yeah. Especially if you measured up in like the corner, the left hand corner versus the lower right corner, it would be completely different. Right. <laughs> and I wonder if it's like zero, like almost zero in the top left and then like 16 in the bottom right or something. That would be nutty. Absolutely. <laughs> Probably. Crazy. Hmm. I do think, yeah, input lag is, is going to be a key battleground as uh, frame gen becomes yep. basically a, a norm over the next, I, you know, however I would many say years. We're, we're at a pretty good spot. With most modern games, I think, have pretty good input latency, and it's largely not an issue most of the time. I think the darkest days were during the PS360 era when everybody was shifting yeah. to very laggy HDTVs and developers were playing with things, you know, like deferred rendering, which has their pretty significant cost in terms of input latency, especially at the time. Uh, and all these things coming together to coalesce into something where I think there was a period of like five years where games just felt bad. And I think yeah. that that sucks. And it's I'm glad we're past that. 
Yeah, it's funny you should mention that, John, because the PS360 era was where input lag analysis, external input lag analysis actually came to the fore. Right. Uh, Mick West of Neversoft, who is now a prolific UFO debunker. Nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Basically, uh, Activision bought him out <laughs> and now he just spends his days living off his wealth and uh, debunking UFOs. Love it. Uh, Metabunk.org. Do check it out. It's a great site. But anyway, the point is, back in the 360 era, <laughs> um, Mick West basically devised the high-speed camera solution. It wasn't so much a high speed, it was a 60 hertz camera at the time. But yeah, the concept of pointing a high-speed camera at a screen and being able to measure the time between button press and the action on the screen, that was all on Mick at the time. I think there was an article on um, whatever you know, the game develop site, which uh, certainly got me invested in it, which led to the controller monitor board uh, where it, you know, it kind of took the uncertainty out of input lag of when the button was pressed by having a little LED. Um, mm-hmm. That was uh, Ben Heck's uh, uh, invention. There a lot of the, a lot of um, game developers actually bought those boards uh, in order to sort of measure how responsive their games were. But yeah, the stuff that Nigel is doing, it's actually news. I mean, I've I've been talking about it to the likes of Nvidia and whatnot. You know take a look at Nigel's work because he's like preeminent at this point. But I'm thinking, John, that actually he should team up with Mike on the retro tink side. Oh, yeah. Um, because there is still this problem, I think, especially with VRR, where his technique is is stands to benefit from actually actual integration into uh, a proper device. <laughs> right. That would be very, very cool. And I think something that could actually be done. 